Today we're going to look at a very aesthetically pleasing which is larger problem. And in particular, we're going to compare pi to the power 3.14 versus 3.14 to the power pi. And the trick that we're going to use in order to determine which one of these is larger will be applicable to lots of problems like this. Okay, so let's dive into it. So I'd like to start with the following little observation. And the observation will be like a little bit of a calculation that will bring us towards something that is equivalent to the inequality that we want to build. Okay, so let's start by assuming that we know that x to the y is less than y to the x. And let's observe that that is equivalent to x to the y to the power 1 over xy is less than y to the x to the power 1 over xy. And you might say, well, how do we know that's true? Well, notice that in the setting that we're working in here, x and y both have to be positive real numbers. And that's because if you put something that's non-positive up here, well, you might get outside of the real numbers into the complex numbers, and inside the complex numbers, this kind of ordering doesn't make sense. But then any sort of exponentiation with a positive real number is an increasing function. So that means that if I have this ordering right here, it's maintained if I raise any side or both sides of this inequality to the same positive real exponent. So that means that this is equivalent to our starting inequality. But now let's observe that that is equivalent to the inequality which is, let's see, x to the power 1 over x being less than y to the power 1 over y. Okay, but what's so great about this versus our starting inequality? Well, I think what's great about this is that we have each of the variables condensed on either side of the inequality. In other words, this left-hand part only depends on x and this right-hand part only depends on y. And so that motivates us to look at a certain function and that function is this. Maybe we'll call it f of t, which is t to the power one over t. And observe that our inequality right here is equivalent to saying that f of x is less than f of y. And now that we've got it written in terms of this function, we can use the machinery of calculus. Okay, so let's maybe jump into that. So let's define our function. And I'm just going to redefine it over here. So f of t equals t to the power 1 over t. And this is going to be for all t on the positive real number. So I'll just write that as an interval from 0 to infinity. Now what I'd like to do is determine where this gets a relative minimum or maximum. Well, perhaps it gets relative minimums and maximums lots of places, but I want to determine those places. But if I know where it has a relative max or min, that means that between the relative maxes or mins, or to the left of the leftmost relative minimum or maximum, and to the right of the rightmost, we'll have a place where this function is always increasing or always decreasing. Okay, so how do we find relative extreme places? Well, we do that by finding where the derivative is zero, or where the derivative does not exist. But we'll see that we'll only really need a place where the derivative is zero. Okay, so how do we find the derivative of this kind of function, which is uh, one of these functions where you have variables in the base and the exponent? Well, we do it with logarithmic differentiation. So let's take the log of both sides. So we'll take the log of f of t and observe that that's the log of t to the power one over t, which is gonna be one over t times the log of t. And now taking the derivative of both sides using the chain rule on the left-hand side, 
we'll have f prime of t over f of t equals, now we've got to use the product rule on the right hand side. So let's see, that's going to be 1 over t squared. That's what we get from taking the derivative of the natural log part. And then we'll have minus the natural log of t over t squared. That's what we get from taking the derivative of the 1 over t part. But now we can factor some stuff out. Perhaps we'd factor a one over t squared out and we'll get one minus the natural log of t. But now let's observe that means that f prime of t can be written as, well, f of t over t squared, but I'm gonna write that as t to the power one over t over t squared times one minus the natural log of t. Now, like I said, we want to find the critical points, the place where that's zero, and that'll help us determine where this function is increasing and decreasing. So let's set this equal to zero. But I'd like to observe that this number out here, this t to the one over t over t squared, maybe I should say this expression out here, is never equal to zero on our domain. That means that this function is equal to zero if and only if, the one minus natural log of t is equal to zero. In other words, when the natural log of t is equal to one, which happens when t is equal to e. So that means our critical point occurs only at e. Okay, well now how can we find intervals of increasing and decreasing? Well, perhaps we do it with a number line. That's a standard first semester calculus technique. So let's write our number line. But in this case, it's just half of a number line because we start at zero, not including zero. So I'm gonna go ahead and put zero here. Notice I have an open circle. And then I'm gonna put E right here because we know E is the place where this can change from being increasing to decreasing. And now what I'll do is I'll pick test points. So look at, let's pick a test point between zero and E. Perhaps I would pick the number one. And then I need to pick a test point to the right of E. I'm gonna go ahead and pick E squared. And that's because plugging that into this function with the natural log um, is nice. Okay, so now let's do our calculations. So let's do F prime of one and see what we get. Well, observe that we're going to get one to the one over one, which is one, over one squared, times one minus the natural log of one. But the natural log of one is pretty clearly equal to zero, so that gives us one, which is positive. Okay, but if we know that the first derivative is positive between zero and e, that means we know there this function is increasing. So I'll just draw a line going up like this to know that this function is increasing on that interval. Now let's plug in our next part, our e squared. So we'll have f prime of e squared. So observe that that's gonna be a number out front and that number is positive. I think that's pretty clear because e squared is positive. We're plugging it into this situation which would be positive times one minus the natural log of e squared but one minus the natural log of e squared is two. So we've got one minus two, which is negative one. Again, this number out front is positive. So that makes this less than zero. So that means if we are to the right of e, this function is decreasing. Okay, cool. So now let's summarize that information and finish this problem off. So thanks for sticking this long into the video. If you're enjoying the video and you haven't clicked the thumbs up, maybe do that. It really helps spread the video out. And if you haven't subscribed yet, also consider subscribing. It really helps us out over here on the channel. Okay, so let's see what we've done so far. We took our function f of t, which is t to the one over t, defined for positive real numbers. And we just showed that it was increasing on the interval from zero to e and decreasing on the interval from e to infinity. And now we can really just finish our problem off here. So let's note that both of the numbers involved in our inequality, 3.14 and pi are on the interval from e to infinity. That's because e is around 2.718. Well, those are both clearly bigger than 2.718. 
So that means we're in the range where f is decreasing. So we know that 3.14 is less than pi. I think that's pretty clear. And so that means when we evaluate both sides of this inequality with our function, we will swap the direction of the inequality because our function is decreasing. So in particular, that means that f of 3.14 is bigger than f of pi. But that's equivalent to saying that pi to the power 1 over pi is less than 3.14 to the power 1 over 3.14. I really just changed the order of these to put the f of pi being less than 3.14 or f of 3.14 because it's a little bit nicer. But now what I can do is exponentiate, essentially reversing this over here, and I'll be left with pi to the power 3.14 is less than 3.14 to the power pi. And there we have it. We have solved the problem, which was our goal, to find which one was larger. And that's a good place to stop.